Hello everyone, Teacher Dens here again. Thank you for keeping up to this channel. Today we discuss all the basics that are involved in getting started with computer programming. We'll look at program development cycle, we'll look at algorithms and all the things that are necessary for us to start our practicals. Well, please, you can consider using the description below this video to receive all the information about this video. You can also engage me through the comments. I will respond to all the questions and maybe the appreciation, the thank you and so on for this video. Otherwise, if you want to watch more of the videos like this, please, you can consider subscribing to the channel. And also, don't forget clicking the notification bell so that you can receive uh, notification immediately when new videos are added. So let's get started accordingly. So today we're covering Introduction to Computer Programming. And uh, we're going to look at terminologies that are used in computer programming. We'll look at computer programming languages then we'll discuss the program development cycle and finally we'll look at uh, how to develop algorithms so let's begin with the terminologies now there are many terms that are used in programming but we'll be sampling very few terms to begin with, let us uh, look at what is computer programming. Now, computer programming simply means the process of designing and building executable programs to accomplish specific tasks. We would simply say the process of writing computer programs. And well, another very important term as said is a computer program. A computer program is a set of instructions that a computer follows to perform specific tasks or solve particular problems. There are tasks like playing music, typing work, playing games that we perform on a day-to-day -day basis. So those tasks are accomplished through set of instructions or set of guidelines that the computer follows to achieve that task that you play or you perform. So programming simply means creating programs and programs are instructions that when followed perform a particular task. Now the other very important term is source code and object code. Now source code simply refers to a program statement that the programmer enters in the editor window which have not yet been translated into machine language please note that the person who writes programs is known as a programmer and while writing software there is this initial statements they are always writing I want you to take a look at that C program statement that we later on understand during the course of the course what everything entails but apparently these lines are known as source codes because they are not yet translated into a language that is understood by the programmer now the next term is object code on the contrary object code simply refers to the program a program code that is in machine readable form so source codes are understood by the programmer because they are already in the language he or she understands and the object codes are in binary and therefore are understood by the computer so the programmer writes the source code in readable statements that he understand but for the program to work, the program has to be translated into object code. Now, it brings us to another very important term, which is language translator. Because the programmer is working with the source code and the computer requires the object code, there must be translator. 
A translator is a special system software used to convert source codes to object codes. There are many examples, but I would be talking about the three, the most commonly used translators. We have the assembler as a translator, we have the interpreter, and then we have the compiler. The three ultimately help to convert the source code into object code. So let's understand how each of these ones does the translation. We begin with the assembler. Well, an assembler is used to translate the program written in assembly language into machine code. A later on, we're going to understand what assembly languages are. But there are some languages that are normally written in low-level language, still in close relation to what the computer understands, but not directly. So uh, to convert the assembly language into object code that is in binary that the, the computer understands, we need an assembler. So we'd say assembler converts the source code into the machine code or which we call the object code that the computer understands okay the next translator is the interpreter and uh, an interpreter translates a source program word by word or line by line you remember we said a program as instructions that have to be followed to perform a particular task. Now, when translating or converting the source code into the object code, the interpreter converts line by line in those series of statements. And that's how it works. And then finally, we have the compiler. How does the compiler work? For the compiler, for it, it translates the entire or the whole source program into object code at once and then executes it into a language code so if you're going to use the compiler to convert your source code into object code then it will be converted all at once that is how the language translators work the assembler the compiler and then the interpreter okay that summarizes the language translators. So next, we're going to summarize with the significance of programming. Like I had given you the intro, throughout the course we'll be discussing the ways of helping you better skills in programming. But why do you need this knowledge of programming? Well, programming dr drives the development of new software or applications. The skills you acquisit here will help you develop some mathematical programs and later when, while you advance, you'll be in position to uh, integrate or consolidate knowledge to develop software. Still, programming can help enable the automation of various tasks and processes. Businesses that have automated processes, they can really make life simpler or simplify processes by use of computer software to write those instructions that will be performed by computers or certain devices. Still, programming can be utilized in the development of educational tools and interactive learning platforms. Because of programming, today we have very many good uh, web real applications real-time applications like uh, google meet we have zoom that are really helpful today in the learning process still programming can be used to create smart infrastructure programming has really helped to uh, like command or like automate devices in internet of things and and Several devices that connect later to the internet can be programmed through programming so that they perform very tremendously. There are many, many merits, very many 
purposes that we can really achieve out of programming. So stick around to the end of this course as you acquisit the various skills that are very important. Okay, now next in our video, we're going to look at programming languages. And uh, I will help you understand what programming languages are. So to begin with, a programming language is simply a system of notation for writing computer programs. We would also say programming language refers to the rules or guidelines or procedure that we follow when developing or writing computer software. They are basically two levels of programming languages. We have low level and then we have high level languages. Low level languages are basic programming languages that can be easily understood by the computer directly. They require no or little interpretation. So in a nutshell, in the rules we follow when writing computer software, the low level languages are understood by the computer. Now, on the contrary, high level languages are languages with strong abstraction from the details of the computer. They are languages written in, in statements that are understood by the programmer. That's perhaps a summary would give the low level languages understood by the computer, high level languages understood by the programmer. Okay, so basically that is the, those are the two levels of programming languages. Let me try to share with you briefly in the examples of program low level languages. We have as machine language and then we have assembly language in a nutshell. Now under high level languages we have lots of examples. We have uh, Python and Python today is widely used in web development, data science, artificial intelligence and automation. We also have Java. Java is very helpful for building enterprise level applications. We can talk about mobile apps, web application. That's all Java as a high level language. C++ is another example of high level language. Its application is very useful in game development, system software, and, and performance critical applications. We have JavaScript whose primary purpose is for web development uh, to help in creating dynamic and interactive user interfaces on websites. That's JavaScript as a programming language. We have C Sharp. Uh, developed by Microsoft to help in Windows application and web services. The list is very endless, but I just sampled a few to give you an insight of programs that are understood by the programmer. All right, so those are the levels of programming languages. Now, the next part of our lesson or our video is to discuss program development cycle. Now, every person who designs software does not just go direct to coding, neither does they just go direct to implementing or deployment of given code. There are logical steps that they have to follow for them to have a systematic process flow or end result or a working software. So let's go through this program development cycle. The first step is known as program recognition. The second step is known as problem definition. The third step is known as program design. You can also categorize it as algorithm development. The fourth step is known as program coding. The fifth step is known as program testing and debugging. And the sixth step is known as program implementation and maintenance. And finally, we have program documentation. So let's take a look at closely, briefly, 
what each of these logical steps means. So the first step, like you notice, is problem recognition. We define a program at the very start as a set of instructions that a computer follows to solve particular tasks. So before you write a software, you must take deep understanding and interpretation of a particular problem. Because in most cases, it is problems that derive us or push us to creating instructions or developing programs that can help solve. So in step one, make sure you've understand, you understand and interpret the problem properly. Now having understood the problem, in the second step, you'll have to define the problem. The definition here entails that you identify the input you will need to solve that problem, what output it will yield to, and the logical steps that you're going to follow in just definition. So after recognize, after understanding and interpreting the problem, you then uh, try to outline the input and output required to solve that problem. In the second step, we have now program design. You can now see the program is coming through, but not even yet coding. So in program design, we try to develop the program process, like we outline all the logical steps that we are going to follow to solve that problem that we identified. This is to help us so that we capture all the necessary steps or tasks that the user will have to follow. Good example is this uh, algorithm that later will understand what it means. The next step is program coding. Now, following the algorithm or the logical steps we identified, we now begin converting it into code or subsequently writing the lines of instructions that now the computer will be uh, following. And after the code has been written, immediately it is tested. And during testing, we identify the errors, like we run the software to verify and identify if possible errors exist. And immediately when we identify errors, debugging comes in as a process to help us to remove the errors. So debugging would simply mean the process of identifying and removing errors from a program code. And immediately after we have tested and debugged, so we've discovered the software is working, we then just go and then implement. So implementation here can simply mean the actual delivery, like installing the software, putting the program in circulation. You can consider installation or adding it on a computer for, for that the software is utilized to solve the problem identified. And once the software has been installed, you must logically prepare some routine tasks that will make the software run very well, maybe backup and, and, and several monitoring to make sure the program works expectedly as planned. Now, finally, it is important that you do documentation. Documentation here simply refers to the writing of supportive materials explaining how the program can be used by users, installed by operators or modified by programmers. Remember, you're the programmer writing the software, but this software is going to be used by different users who don't know. So while you've written, while you've written the program and it is working, please provide a manual, a document on how given parts of the program will be utilized or errors will be resolved once detected. So those are the logical steps that if followed can really help the programmer to have a good working software that can be deployed. 
Well, the final part of our video today, we want to discuss how to develop algorithms. Having understood algorithms as logical steps, the instructions or the procedure the computer is going to follow to solve a given task. So before we jump into the code, we need to develop algorithms that we will have to follow when writing the code. Now, what's an algorithm? An algorithm is defined as a step-by-step -step procedure or set of rules designed to perform a specific task or solve a particular problem. We can also say algorithm is the number of logical steps to be followed to solve a particular problem. Take a look at this I have statements there, start, message is displayed, input is collected, processing is done, and then the program ends. So that's one way of outlining the logical steps. The other way is putting it in a diagram. In a nutshell, you'll be understanding shortly what those two are, but we can consider them as examples of algorithms. So let's let's begin with pseudocode. There are two ways of preparing algorithms. We can use a pseudocode or we can use a flowchart. So a pseudocode is a method of documenting program logic in form of English-like statements that are to be used while describing the processing steps. I want you to take a look at that. We're practically going to understand it. We are outlining the instructions or the procedure in the form of English-like steps. For example, start, print, input, and so forth, as you see in the picture. Well, there are some guidelines that you will have to follow to always make very working or helpful pseudocodes. The first guideline is that your code must always have a begin or a start and an end or stop. That's a very, very important guideline. The second guideline, you must make sure that your statements are very clear short and readable. The other very important guideline is you have to use indentation like I'll be demonstrating and then you have to use the English-like statement and probably include comments to help describe what you're writing. So let's try to take a look in an example. I have an example here which is Write a pseudocode that can be used to prompt the user to enter two numbers, calculate sum and average of the two numbers, and then display the output on the screen. So that's the problem. And now, like we said, recognize the, pro the problem. Then the second step is define the problem that is defined meaning get the get to outline input and output and then later on you continue with the algorithm so let's try to look at that so using pseudocode i've said must have start so we write start that is the first statement that should be written then we've said in the other guideline we must indent and indent means you're going to leave some space, you're going to leave some gap away from the margin. Now, the question says the pseudocode should prompt the user to enter. Prompt the user, meaning we are displaying a message. So we can always use statements like print, read, uh, or we can use yeah, print, uh, pr print or display to give some message to the user. So this word print we are having in this statement is directing, is giving the message to the user because the question is prompt the user to enter. So before the user does the entry, 
they must see a message declaring or telling them of the type of input. So the message is very clear, enter two numbers. And ultimately, when the message has been displayed, the next logical step would be now collecting the input. And we are just using numbers A, B, C to denote the two numbers. Maybe somebody can use X, Y, L, M, whatever, as long as there are two numbers. After the entry, look at the question. Prompt the user to enter two numbers. And then calculate sum and average. So after the inputs, the computer will calculate sum. And sum is a processing command. So mathematically, sum is addition. And that is the first number plus the second number. Then also the computer is processing average, that's a processing command. And average is obtained by getting sum divided by two. And finally, look at the question. The, the program should display the output on the screen. What is it displaying? It is displaying sum and then it is also displaying average. So to display, we use the statement print. You can also use even the word display as English-like statement to denote that step. And finally, like we said in the guideline, the program should stop. So start and stop or begin and end must appear there. We have to include indentation, that is leave some gap away from the executable statements then I write the other statement using English-like and then make them short, clear, precise, readable and, and other guidelines like we have followed. So you can try to do very many examples. In the next videos, we'll explore more advanced examples on writing pseudocode. So let's move to the other method of writing pseudocodes, rather writing algorithms. We can write algorithms using flowcharts. What's a flowchart? A flowchart is a diagrammatic or pictorial representation of a program's algorithm. We can use diagrams to outline or to show the logical steps that will be followed while solving a particular problem. A good example is that we have a diagram which is really showing the various steps that the program or the computer is going to follow to solve that given problem. We'll understand it in just a while. Okay, so like I gave guidelines for writing pseudocodes, let's look at the general uh, symbols that we use when writing our flowcharts or, or when writing our algorithms. So, well, the first very important symbol is known as the oval. Just as it appears here, the oval can be used to denote the beginning and the end. Then we have the flow line which is just a line. This line with an arrow helps us to denote the direction or the process, the, the, the movement. Eh? Now, the next symbol is the parallelogram. The parallelogram denotes either an input or output. We can use it to show that there is an input and we can also use it to show that there is an output as well. The other very important symbol is the rectangle. The rectangle can be used to denote a process. And uh, inside it, we can always put in the actions or the processes that are taking place in that very uh, statement. Then we have a, another very important symbol as the parallelogram. The, the, the diamond rather or the rhombus so the diamond denotes a decision uh, to be made the program should continue along with two roots whenever we use that diamond we should have at least two roots coming from it uh, a root to show when it is true and then a root to show when it is false 
then finally we have the circle and circle is a connector when you have a big uh, maybe program or big algorithm and it can't fit uh, you can always use connectors to really show continuity of given instructions or processes that are ongoing okay we're going to try an example out and we check how we utilize those symbols accordingly so in our example we have the simple question there it is draw a flow chart for a program that can be used to prompt the user to enter two numbers calculate sum and average of the two numbers and then display the result on the screen please note the tasks inside in problem definition we're supposed to know input and we're supposed to know output eh? in that case with the problem has already been recognized so the input the user will have a message on screen asking him to enter input and what is the input is entering two numbers and after that there is processing done for some there is also processing done for average and then the message is given on the screen so like we said we begin with the oval because we say the oval can be used to, to denote uh, start or begin and also it can be used to denote what uh, end or stop so we draw an oval and whenever we draw the shape we have to put inside the activity or the action which is under play at that very instant then immediately after we have drawn that the next thing is now for us to use the line the line with an arrow helps us to show the direction so from start immediately we will have some message displayed on the screen so the parallelogram can be used to display but also it can be used to input so for that reason we shall start the program display the message on the screen that message will be telling the user to enter two numbers then the same parallelogram will also be used to collect the information from the user the parallelogram does two things it does the input and also does the output now after that we expect some processing to occur so we use the arrow to denote the next action and after that we now outline that process so from there we shall go to sum because the program does summation that means it adds the two numbers and then it also does the average process which is get sum divided by two and then finally rather second last we expect the pro program to display and like i guided for us to display we use a parallelogram a parallelogram inside it we must mention what it is doing that time for that case we've write we've written print sum and also print average average denoting that the program is displaying messages it is displaying sum which is the outcome of adding two numbers and it is displaying average which is the outcome of adding the two numbers divide by two and finally the program has to stop so we have in this case represented our algorithm into logical steps in form of diagrams so you can always prepare your algorithms you you can always organize your logical steps using either pseudocodes which are english like statements or you can also prepare them using flowcharts like i promised in the later videos we'll be covering more here trying to explore how we can now do uh, big examples or broad examples where we, we utilize more of these shapes right i hope you found this video very helpful uh, next video we'll be discussing the other basics that are uh, involved like installing integrated development environment and configuring the compiler 
we also discuss other terms that are very very important in the computer practical programming and then we'll start the practical programming so please stay in touch and uh, keep engaging me through the comments if there is any other video you want me to prepare accordingly you can uh, send me a comment through this video so see you again guys this is teacher thence and be safe thank you